This is the slab serif typography lecture for the beginning typography class. And in this lecture, we'll go over the history of slab serif typography and look at some of the common attributes and different slab serif typefaces that are notable through the history of slab serif type. Slab serif typography is type that has enlarged, thick, block-like serifs that are shown at the termination of strokes. These serifs come in a variety of shapes and sizes, but are all enlarged and a major design element of the letter forms. Slab serif typefaces are also sometimes known as Egyptian, square serif, or mechanical. Slab serif typefaces started evolving, and as they did, they sometimes had the term Egyptian applied to them. That was really a term that was applied because it was a popular culture at the time that these typefaces were released. Obviously, square serif is describing the type or the look of the serifs that were on slab serif typefaces. And the mechanical, again, refers a little bit to the mechanical structure of these typefaces. These really grew out of the Victorian era, and again, were a necessity in terms of attracting attention and having letter forms that spoke very loudly. So here's an example of a slab serif typeface. This is Ames Century Modern, which was done by House Industries. It was released in 2010, so it's a relatively recent typeface, but it really celebrated the legacy of Charles and Ray Ames. It's a wonderful example of a Clarendon-style typeface, beautiful release done by House. Here's an example of some of the posters that we were talking about, the ones that demanded this attention. And you can see here in Houdini's, these heavy, heavy slabs at the bottom of these serifs that are really attracting attention. It creates a boldness. And that's really what people were after when they developed these kinds of typefaces. So we first saw these in 1815 with Figgins Antique. This is an example we looked at earlier. We can see this development where they're enlarging and really emphasizing these serifs, again, to get attention. So when we're looking at slab serif typefaces, the characteristics that are really there are heavy serifs, extreme contrast oftentimes here. We see a lot of thick, thin relationships. Not always, but a lot of the time. Usually we're looking at a vertical stress, and we have a large X height. And that's really due to the nature of these typefaces and their needing to be read. Here's an example of some of the very heavy weights of Ames Century Modern. You can see these intricacies that are here and how well the lowercase works. Here's another slab serif typeface from House Industries. This is Neutroface Slab. It's an example of a geometric slab serif. So here we're looking at more of a circular geometry driven design. And then here's Aim Century Modern's italic, beautiful italic. You can see this wonderful high contrast between these stroke weights and this gorgeous balance of form and how this italic was developed. So when we're discussing the history of slab serif typefaces, we really start with Vincent Figgins. 1815, we saw the specimen of his antique. But we also see this with some of the other work that came out of the fat faces. So in the same way that typographers were really blowing up and enhancing that thick, thin relationship for modern or Dedone style typefaces, there was a similar manipulation that happened with the way that these heavy block-like serifs were created. That's why we're looking at this specimen on the right where we're seeing some of the different examples there. Here's David Burlow's Giza. This was released in 1994. It's really based on the original work of Figgins and the original slab serif typefaces. So this is a more of a revival, but a great example of a slab serif typeface. It's released by Font Bureau. Then we have to look at the work of Robert Thorne because he really developed the first fat face. And as we talked about, fat faces had some influence in terms of the development of these slab serifs, just in terms of the manipulation and exaggerating these thick thin relationships. And this was released in 1806. This is Paul Barnes Austin, which is a good example of a reinterpretation or a typeface that is in the same genre as these fat faces. And this was released through commercial type, which is owned also by Christian Schwartz. Then the next development we really have is through the Fan Street Foundry, and that's through Robert Thorne, Robert Beasley, and Benjamin Fox, who developed the first Clarendon-style typeface. Benjamin Fox was the punch cutter, so he was the one that was actually working on creating those punches. But here's their first Clarendon, and this was a very popular release. It worked really well in text. It has a high bracketing, which gives it more of a warmth and tones down some of the geometry and angularity of other slab serif typefaces we saw to this point. And once it was created, we saw 
many, many variations of it. After a period of time, other people started emulating, creating their own versions of these Clarendons to the point where almost every foundry had some kind of Clarendon style. Here we're looking at the typeface Super Clarendon, and its popularity led to it really being a genre of its own within the slab serif category. The typeface we were looking at from the beginning, this is Aim Centering Modern, it is again an example of a Clarendon style typeface. It's really looking at some of the characteristics of Clarendons and reinterpreting them. Clarendons are really known for their bracketing, and bracketing is a concept where a rounding is added to the transition between the serif and the stem. So if we look on the left here, we're looking at an uppercase T that does not have bracketing, and you can see that very strong right angle at the bottom between that stem and that serif. Where on the right, we're looking at more of a bracketing. There's a rounding out of that transition between the serif and the stem. So it's no longer at a right angle. There's a more of a rounded form there. And we'll see different amounts of bracketing and different styles of bracketing, but bracketing really refers to a term where we're seeing that rounding happening in those transitional areas. You can see that also at the top of the T, but it doesn't appear everywhere. But when we see typefaces that have this characteristic, again, it's known as bracketing. The other thing about Clarendon style typefaces is that they worked really well in text and they eventually even developed italics for them, which you're seeing on the right. So that also gave them maybe a little bit more room to grow as a style because they had a little bit more versatility than some of the other slab serif typefaces we'd seen. Then we had all kinds of other explorations. We have what we would call a reverse stress. This is what we're looking at at the top here, where there's a reversal in the stress and the weight of this typeface. So it looks very, very odd, and that's because where the thins are normally, we're looking at thicks, and where the thicks are, we're actually looking at thins. And when people reverse these conventions that are built in our mind through these calligraphic structures that have been built for hundreds of years, it looks very odd to us. And we first saw this in 1821, and it's something that would be explored on and on, this idea of reverse stress typefaces. Eventually it was refined in a maybe slightly better way than what we're looking at here. And we sometimes refer to these as French Clarendons. These became very popular in the 1860s. But you can see again here, not as much contrast as we were looking at before, but again that reversal of stress, where the stress in the letter forms live. We also even saw this recently. This is the typeface Orwellian that we looked at, and it's an example again of a reverse stress, also very high contrast, and sometimes these were even referred to as Italians, so that was another name that they gave to these reverse stress typefaces. And these were really popular with the circus and with the Wild West, so we oftentimes associate these with Western movies and circus posters and things of that nature. They're also very much related to wood type because a lot of these typefaces were initially created in wood. It's a more malleable material. It was something that was very forgiving. It allowed for modifications to serifs, which we talked about in one of the previous lectures as well. So a lot of the places where we see a lot of wonderful slab serif typography are places that have a rich history in wood type. And one of those is the Hamilton Wood Type Museum. And that's in Two Rivers, Wisconsin, and is a wonderful depository of hundreds of years of wood type that they have cataloged and created within their studio. There's also a printing facility here where they've printed an incredible history of letterpress posters for a plethora of different topics and events. We'll also go back to this diagram. This is a diagram we looked at that shows all the variations, all the different kinds of slab serifs that exist. And this was done by Rob Roy Kelly. He was a type historian that ran another very notable wood type archive in Austin. But here we look at the antiques. So those are those traditional unbracketed slab serifs. And then we have those Clarendons where you can see that addition of bracketing. And then we go to the Latins, where there's the wedge-like serif, so there's a slicing there. And then the Tuscans, which are much more decorative. So these are the different kinds of slab serifs that we see, the subcategories that exist within this genre. So here's an example of a Latin. We can see those wedge-like serifs, the way they've resolved these things in the lowercase. Here's an example of a Tuscan. This is zebra wood. Here it is a little bit bigger. We oftentimes see this in baseball or other athletic brands, but they're very playful. Again, we also see them oftentimes with circus. Here's an example of an inline Tuscan. So they got incredibly decorative, and part of that was 
because of the way that they were made in wood. But this is a specimen of this wonderful inline Tuscan typeface. So you're starting to see the variation, the amount of display type that exists within the slab serif category, the amount of decorative elements that were oftentimes added to them. Here's a common one that we see. This is Rosewood, a typeface that was released by Adobe. And it does have a non filled version, but this is the version that has this decorative filling to all of the letter forms. So we have Rudolf Wolf, and he really explored geometric slab serifs for the first time. So this is in 1929, the release of Memphis, and he was really influenced by Cable and Futura and some of the sans serif releases that had come out before this. And so we saw that influence of geometry come into the slab serif category as well and led to the development of quite a few different slab serif geometric typefaces. Then we have Morris Fuller Benton, an American typographer we've talked about before, and he released Stymie in 1931, which is a typeface we still see today. It's used sometimes in the New York Times, and it had this wide set of alternates that made it particularly popular. But again, another geometric slab serif typeface that really was referencing some of the work we'd seen in sans serif, as well as the work of Memphis. Then we had Monotype, who released another geometric slab serif in 1934 known as Rockwell. Very popular release, still something we see today, used for a lot of corporate brands. A wonderful workhorse typeface that comes in a plethora of weights. We also had the work of Adrian Frutiger, someone we've looked at before, and he released Serifa, which was a pairing. This was a work in a slab serif genre that was meant to work tightly with Univer. So you can see some of the DNA and some of the design characteristics from Univer are really brought into this typeface. So this is an example of somebody taking some of the sans serif work that was done and developing a slab serif typeface that would pair nicely with that sans serif. Then of course we had the typewriter which we looked at. So as typewriters were built, they needed different typefaces that would work on these machines. And so we looked at the creation of the Selectrix which had different typefaces that people could choose. This was the first time that that typographic choice was put in the user's hands. So that meant that there needed to be the creation of multiple typefaces that they could choose from. But even before this, there was the creation of different typewriter oriented typefaces. And typewriters really bring a unique set of challenges because they're monospaced, which means that the space between all the letter forms needs to be even. They also frequently have serifs. They're monolinear. They have a unique structure, although they do fall within the slab serif category. So the first one we'll look at is Clayton Smith, and he developed Prestige in 1953. This was for IBM, and we can see some idiosyncrasies here in some of these swooping serifs, but again, that slab serif monolinear structure is so clear here. This is a very characteristic typewriter typeface. Then we have the work of Howard Kettler. In 1955 for IBM, he released Courier, which is probably one of the most famous examples of typewriter typography. And here is a wonderful specimen of it. You can see that great monolinear structure, these interesting curves that are introduced in some places, but clearly slab serif construction. Then we have Herb Lubelin. So he was someone that we looked at and he created avant-garde. And in 1974, he modified avant-garde or looked at avant-garde and created what we know as Lubelin graph which is a slab serif typeface that was meant to work in conjunction with avant-garde or to be similar to the look and design aesthetics of that typeface. Then we have Peter Matthias Norzig, who released a typeface in 1991 known as Cassilia. And this is a really important typeface because it really looked at humanist structures for its inspiration. And it also is very, very popular. It's a typeface we saw very frequently and was extremely successful. It has a warmth to it that really made it different from a lot of the slab serif typefaces we saw up until this point. It also had a true italic. So this is not an oblique, this is a true italic where we're looking at a modification of form that creates the italic structure. Then we have Eric Spikerman, and in 1990, he created a set of typefaces for business correspondence known as Officina. So there is a slab serif version of it, which we're looking at here. Wonderful typeface. Very narrow, good for space saving settings, but also worked really well for business correspondence. Although it ended up being a popular typeface that worked for a plethora of other uses. Here's Officina Sans, which again was a sans serif counterpart to Officina Serif. Then we have some of the work of Jonathan Hoffler and Tobias Fierro Jones. They released quite a few wonderful slab serif typefaces. 
One of them being Archer, which was released in 2003. This was a typeface that was originally commissioned by Martha Stewart Living Magazine. They were looking for a structured slab serif typeface, but that had some warmth and feminine qualities to it. And it really led to this design of these exaggerated ball terminals, this wonderful monolinear geometric structure. They also worked on Sentinel, another typeface in the Clarendon style. Great typeface that comes in a plethora of weights. Here's their italic, which was a really important part of this typeface because historically a lot of these typefaces didn't come with italics, so they have a full range of italics that were also released. And then we have Vitesse, which is a super elliptical, rounded, squared style slab serif typeface. You'll notice no bracketing here. There's a technical style to it, and it was originally designed for Wired magazine, but it was retooled and released to the public later on. We have the work of House Industries, which we've looked at already. We looked at their wonderful AIM Century Modern, but they had some other great slab serif releases. One of them being United. This was an enormous typeface. It came in a range of weights and styles, different condensed and extended. We're looking at the stencil here, but it did come in solid versions as well. We often saw this used for athletics and other hyper-masculine products. We have Neutroface Slab, which we looked at. This is a wonderful geometric slab serif typeface. It's really meant to pair with their very, very popular Neutra face, which was inspired by lettering from the architect Richard Neutra, but this was a slab serif counterpart to that sans serif typeface. And then of course, Aim Century Modern, which we already looked at, this wonderful bracketed Clarendon inspired typeface that has a lot of warmth and cork that makes it a great workhorse typeface. It comes in a plethora of weights, which makes it incredibly useful. So these are a lot of these wonderful contemporary slab serif typefaces. This is a genre that is continually being explored. And we see great releases coming out on a regular basis in this category. Not that it doesn't happen in others, but these are some of the more recent things we've seen in the slab serif category. We also have the work of Cyrus Highsmith, an incredibly talented type designer. He has created many typefaces, but one of them is Dispatch, which is this interesting slab serif typeface that comes in a range of weights and styles. It has extended and condensed weights. Here we're looking at the regular. Here's some of the bolder weights. And then again, these extended weights that made it really useful as a typeface. Kind of harkens back to some of the Wild West wood typography but blends it with this more technical edge that makes it this really interesting contemporary release. And then work of Klim, Chris Sowersby from New Zealand. He released Pitch recently, which is a wonderful new typewriter-inspired typeface that has these corks and these warmth and this wonderful range of weights that makes it incredibly useful and, again, inspired by the typewriter typefaces that we saw up to this point. 